I have to say it feels a little strange to come to our, one of our closest neighbors and speak English. <laughs> but it is as it is. <laughs> so I do it. So uh, first, thank you, sisters and brothers, that you let me come here and meet you all. And I will start today by talking about three things. First, stories then a society under a new form of pressure, and then the relief of the gospel. And tomorrow I will try to say something about language for that, and uh, body language and the importance of that. But I start with something about the power of stories. The author Janet Winterson who was raised in a strictly Christian and in many ways a terrible adoptive family up in northwest England, writes about the power of language and the power of stories in a book she called Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal. And I quote... I believe in fiction and the power of stories because that way we speak in tongues. We are not silenced, all of us, when in deep trauma we find we hesitate, we stammer, there are long pauses in our speech. The thing is stuck. We get our language back through the language of others. We can turn to the poem. We can open the book. Somebody has been there for us and deep-dived the words. Somebody has been there for us. I believe that the Bible-oriented Winterson here writes not only about an author's calling, but also about incarnation. The lines are a cry for, uh, from, the, from the deepest darkness that Christ entered into by free, free will. A darkness which Winterson herself ended up in on the verge of suicide before the light broke into her darkness. I read these words a couple of weeks ago for the first time and thought that they have much to say into the theme for this conference. Our mission is not only to say the right words, but to retrieve the words from a place where recognition and companionship is possible. To deep dive into the words to deep dive into incarnation, to deep dive into our society, and to deep dive into our own experiences and feelings, and then pick up words on behalf of someone else. Before I say a little more on that, I will take you to a January evening. It was heavy, wet, snow in Stockholm. I was invited by the county council of Stockholm city to speak. And I, I got my theme some weeks before, and it was written as this, being a parent of children with multi-handicap. When the day started to approach, I was sitting with the, that note and thinking, what, what kind of people in Stockholm goes to an evening with a title being parents to a children with multi-handicap. And uh, I guess parents with children with multi-handicap. And I prepared for that and I talked about that. I told them a little bit of our own experience in which two of our sons were born with a 
brain disease that make the last years of their lives unbearable heavy. They died when they were 14 and 15 years old. And after a sentence like that, uh, you feel that you want to be quiet for at least an hour. It was a long night, and when it was over, a young man came up to me and said he wanted to thank me. There's been, thing, been something uh, strange about this night, he said. I recognized myself in every word you said. So I said to him, then I understand that you also live in a similar situation. But no, he wasn't even a parent himself. He had never known a person with some extensive disabilities. So now this was starting to get very strange. So I asked him, how can you come to me and say that you recognized yourself in every word? Our, our story must be quite far away from your everyday life. But then he corrected me and said, but that is not the case. That is not how it works. My background is that I... Background is that I I grew up with an alcoholic father, a drug-addicted father, and how that has felt inside of me, you have talked about for more than two hours. Thank you. How that is to life, live a life like that, I know nothing about. But right there comes the next thought. What if we all tell about the same story in thousand and thousand versions? About entering this world without our own effort? Curiously discover life and the world around us? Strive and rest? Swirl through life like an autumn leave in the strong wind, and then one day break up and leave all that was ours, all that we loved. And that it is when we leave that the, the general, the sweeping formulations into the nar that narrative that we put words on our common situation or experience. It's then the room in some way opens up. It is a miracle when it happens, but it's not new. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with each other, John. To deep dive for the words on behalf of someone else. One can approach the, the theme for these days in many ways and from many directions. And I can only do it from mine, from what I see. And I also want to do it from the feedback I receive on my books and from countless radio programs in the Swedish radio. What is it that has responded or answered from the soul of my people? Where... Where did, did or does contact occur? When does the gospel touch people who long for it without knowing they do? When I try to sum that up, um, I, I am not an anthropologist, as you know. I am an evangelist. And when I try to do that, I found that in recent, recent year, I met so many people that had expressed a deep spiritual tiredness or fatigue. A tiredness that we can't cheer up by telling them that they have to pull themselves up. It's much deeper than that. 
It's rooted in something else. It must be taken seriously. It must be respected. I had an early breakfast in that kind of hotel, you know, that has the toilet and the shower in the hallway and only a little wash basin in the room. Simple, small, charming, and of course, everything you need. When I came to the breakfast room early in the morning, I realized that it was there they had put their resources, resources, not in the rooms. It was tasteful and comfortable, and also a breakfast buffet that was the big surprise of that stay. The long table was so stocked with things that it was absolutely impossible to find a single empty space where I could put down the plate while I was about to cut the bread. After a failed attempt to hold the plate with one hand and cut the bread with the others, you have tried it. I, I gave up and I took an extra round to the table and, and, and then get the other things. Uh, I heard myself, and I didn't like it, expel some deep, deep sick, uh, that I couldn't avoid it. Uh, that sound, isn't it often like this in hotels? And isn't it strange that no one, no one thinks about this when they set the table? It must be the same problem for everyone. Uh, then I realized that this may well be a small, everyday description of a life in a society where we have access to everything, where everything is possible, when everything can be reached and reached rapidly or quickly. But also that there is a price for that freedom. That's what we're talking about these days. Number one, to stay in the hotel. Number one, uh, we no longer have a place where we can put our lives down. Number two, we have to carry everything ourselves. And in the long run, it ends up under a new form of pressure, the I pressure. Did you know that the most common song on funerals in the UK is I did it my way? There's a lot of beauty and importance in the text that Paul Anka wrote and that found its way to the masses when Frank Sinatra took it up. But I, I can't let go of the fact when, that when it sails up as the funeral th song, it also says something about how our view on life and ourself has changed. To sum up a life with, I did it my way. It may be sound like the utmost freedom, but it's a freedom without roots, and pretty soon you discover that the freedom has become the pressure. Everything ends up on my shoulder. Freedom is not to do everything you want, when you want to do it, how you want to do it. That is rather the definition of loneliness. And into that loneliness, we are called to bring the gospel. We have traveled the world now, and now we are longing for coming home. We have gained a large network and found that now we longing for, we have a housing need of anchoring somewhere. Lars Denick, as you know probably better than I do, from uh, Roskilde University, 
has said that a man who lived in the turn of the century, around 1900, met in his lifetime about 200 people in some kind of rela relation. A friend of mine calculated that this was the amount of people that his nine-year-old son met every week. The same turn on a century man had to, to process through his lifetime about approximately about as much information as one weekend issue of the morning paper Dagens Nyheter holds or Kristelig Dagblad. We have been trying to pick up and together and one, my identi identity uh, of everything that seems good. Lifestyle, values. We have tried to write the text of our lives ourselves. We have been digging deep for our true identity, our true selves, and done that without finding the freedom and the stillness that we were longing for. We have experimented by, with, with sexuality, and now we are longing for fidelity and faithfulness. We have heard and tried everything new, and now we're looking for what has been tried and found sustainable. The pendulum is swinging back. I'm thinking a lot of this burden on our shoulders. If I'm going to have, I did it my way on my funeral, it means that I have to do it my way while I'm alive. I have to do it, and that's a too heavy burden for us to bear. But the gospel has a lot to say here. And the gospel has something else to say here. Namely, that freedom is surrender. That freedom, freedom is letting go. That freedom is to give up. To take one's beating and bleeding heart in the palm of my hand and give it over to Christ with a silent prayer that it will be handled with care. And that it is from that very position the world open up itself. Correct me if I, I'm wrong. I'm not sure that this is some, some common thing, but uh, I think that the most common answer you get when you ask someone how he or she are doing is about good but tired. Mainly not from elderly people but from young people. Most of those seeking counseling or soul care in our church, the main part or young adults. Young adults under an enormous pressure. And this has not been the case before. And your wife, how's she? She's good, but tired. And your colleagues, oh, they are tired, very tired. Usually not from hard physical work, but tire under another pressure that is as heavy to carry, spiritual weight, some kind of spiritual pressure under that you don't connect, you are everywhere, but you're not longer home with yourself. One expression of this is that we are talking about, as you know, that we're not being enough. It's an interesting thing to say. 
not enough as parents, not en enough as life peers, not enough either at home or at work, and above all, not both at home and at work. If it's working on one place, it's alarm on, on the others, and, and with, the, with the air out of us comes the deep thick that carries the words, I'm simply not enough. So we take a community that are crazy and lay it on our shoulders. I am not enough when it is the society that is crazy. I wrote a little tree liner on that some years ago. Uh, this is maybe my most quoted text ever. So now you have to prepare for some Nobel Prize quality. Ready? Yes. Yeah. Three lines. You don't have to be enough. It's enough that you are existing. Anything beyond that is a bonus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Too kind. Too kind. Uh, I'll try to find out why these lines got wings. That I found these, find these words everywhere, quoted in books, up on people's refrigerators, I found them on postcards and all over. And the only thing I can think of is that maybe these words create a place where we can lay our our lives, lives down, a place where there's space enough to receive life, stay, and be rooted, maybe. Something that touches to this tiredness that we don't know where to land our life and get more tired for every day. Some time ago, a report appeared on Gallup Institutes, uh, which is, has currently been focused on the word well-being. I went for an education in Gallup in London a few years ago, and after that, I received a lot, I received a lot of material around their, service, their, their surveys. Uh, at that time, when I was there, very much was focused on getting people and teams to be more effective in organizations. But now it has gone more and more over to this well-being. How are people in your organization? And that this well-being, of course, is composed by a variety of things. But in the latest materials that I got two or three weeks ago, um, a Japanese research couple had asked people in 116 countries the following question. Would, would you rather live an exciting life or a calm life? You can guess, but not loud. 72% said they wanted a calm life. 16% said they wanted an exciting life, and 10 wanted both. <laughs> a calm, exciting life. And I, I like the 10% there. I think it's, it happens when you rest. But what, what kind of conclusion can be drawn from that? Maybe that humans today more than anything else, long for this place to put down their feet, come back to something simple, narrow, something that they can grasp. And this mo movement is nearly overly explicit today. More and more people are moving into a few big cities, you know, but the same people are longing out to the countryside. 
The pandemic has only reinforced a movement that has been going on for a long time, almost like a new green wave. And I'm thinking of the, all the TV programs. I know you have them in Denmark as well. About farmers, old houses, primitive, primitive life, etc., etc. Someone said, the big city offers space, but the village offers a place. I love Paul's words in 1 Corinthians. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Kephas, or the world or life or death, or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are of Christ and Christ is of God. There's an absolute center here. There's an absolute place here. And doesn't Paul sound a little more enthusiastic than he normally does? I think so. But it's no surprise. It must have been absolutely mind-blowing to see this. The whole world belongs to him that belongs to Christ. Whoever belongs to Christ has access to everything and have no need to go hunting for it anymore. Or with other words, I think I have written in 10 books, you can relax. You don't have to carry everything yourself. Christ is the place where you can put down your life and get freedom back. The place where all is yours. So from my point of view, how to present gospel in a time or society like this. I think that it, depending on the, on the pressure, have to come from below, very, very clear from below. If the whole world tells you what you can become if you climb higher, the gospel tell you what you can fall back on. And the difference is enormous. You don't have to become anything. That's gospel. You already are. You're created in God's image. You don't need to write the text to your own life or, st or story. The text is already written and your identity is written in the heart of Christ. That's the safest and the most free place in the universe. And I'm happy to remind you, you already know this, but our glorious calling and mission is to push that gospel under the burden of our society and say, someone else can take both you and this burden and bear it. This is what I call the easing effect of the gospel. The inner stress, the force of constant growth is an enemy of all spiritual life. Faith is something else. Faith is love and love can never be forced. On the other hand, with anyone even having to ask you to do so, you are happy to move in the direction of the person you love without saying one word. You just feel that you want to do it. A few years ago, I, I wrote that book Some you, you quoted, uh, the title from uh, Sker Mens Du Vilar. 
about. Uh, and uh, it is the, the one book of mine that have, have reached out furthest, really. Uh, it has given me the chance to, to share the gospel in, in Sweden, but also in many count, countries out of, uh, around Europe. I don't know why the book reached so far. I've read better books, really. Uh, maybe because the book respects the, the physical and the spiritual tiredness of the readers. They don't say, the book don't say, cheer up. The book says, says, it's okay that you're tired. There's a message in your tiredness. Maybe because the book helped some reader to embrace their, their tiredness under the pressure instead of trying to stimulate it away, which is not pos possible. Maybe because it showed a pattern of doing more and more and experiencing less and less. And above all, it tells that the gospel is a love story. Before everything else, a story of love. It talks about falling in love, a wonderful expression. And I like that. To love is to fall. To love is to let go. To love is to lose oneself to someone else and win freedom. So I want to close this by uh, a little reflection on love, on falling in love. And I hope you see that at the same time, it is a story of faith. And I think the best way of talking about faith is talking about love. This is what I think as years go by. Uh, that the art of loving someone and remaining loved over time is very much about letting go of each other, not holding each other too tightly. There is something strange with love, uh, and that there is, that's, uh, as soon as you hold each other too tight, you, you block the path for the love that you want to protect when you do it. Love must come of its own free will, otherwise it won't come at all. This is beautifully described in the high songs in the Bible. The bride and the bride, the, the groom, uh, are together in their love nest, and the bride now sleeps at the shoulder of the groom. Uh, they are good so. They don't expect anything more from each other right now. They are not asking anything from each other. They are there in some atmosphere of that it's good as it is. And then comes the words, don't disturb love until it wants to. Perhaps this is the room that has the lacks or get, have gone lost in a society where life has become a project, uh, where everything has to be something, that we have loosened this beautiful art of just letting things be what they are. The room 
where it's okay to be tired and say it. Where, you can, where we can meet each other as we are. And I'm thinking a lot of relationships and marriage. And it maybe sounds a little too laid back, but uh, I need the room where I can speak with the one I love and say about. Yeah, maybe we could have a little more fun. Maybe our life could be a little more ex exciting. But now it is the way it is. And then we say to each other, and that's good enough. Because at that point, a miracle happens. Love wakes up again and love comes again but we must have to come we, we must come to the point when we loosen the grip and just fall in love with each other not only one time but fall in love again and again for a lifetime there is speaking about faith there is an enorm Tremendous freedom there. A freedom with deep roots. A freedom in Christ. A freedom when all are yours. And I, I can't imagine a more beautiful and honorable mission than to be a messenger of that gospel. And as the years go by, I have been in the same church, in the Pentecostal church, in the heart of Gothenburg for 37 years now. And I think if, if nothing happens, I will stay there until they carry me out. Uh, because I love it. Uh, but as the years go by, the gratitude for having this calling over my life just grows. It's sometimes tiring. It's sometimes I'm ungrateful. But sisters and brothers, uh, this is so deeply meaningful. And without doubt, the highest honor that can be given to a human. A, a human. So... Uh, Wear it like a crown. Thank you.